So I think everybody is joining our webinar. I'm happy to have you all here. Hello, everybody. I'm seeing the first chatting box coming up. Hi, everybody. Thanks for being here with the NS Neurotrauma section. Today's webinar will be about something we were um, eager to share with you, which is the experience of the committee members with the Neurotrauma Lab. So we will talk today about several aspects of translational research, which I'm very eager to know myself more about. I will share with you my screen just to know uh, our lineup of speakers. So first of all, we will have Dr. Dietwurst and Professor De Petier about um, cerebrovascular physiology in um, large animals. So this is the first talk we will uh, hear from. And then we have Professor Rostami about translational neurotrauma. Then, I'll, then Dr. Alexander Yunsi about uh, a step-to-step -step guide, which will be very useful as well. And then we will end with Professor Marklon with um, translational studies of wet matter injury in TBI. So um, if I think we're ready to start. So we're kind of, uh, num the number of participants is rising, so I'm glad about it. But I think we're ready to start. Uh, Dr. Dietworth is hey. professor. Yes, yes. Uh, thank you, Laura, and thanks a lot for organizing this uh, webinar, which will, uh, will which will be very interesting. I was very much looking yes. forward. So I will share my screen and pull up our presentation. I hope everything works for you. Perfectly, yes. Okay, thank you. So um, in Leuven, we have a porcine cranial window model, which we um, developed or actually uh, modified from an existing model a couple of years ago. And um, as a first thing, if you want to do research on animals or on living tissues, the first question you have to ask is, do I need an animal? Can I not do it with, with a tissue culture, for instance? And if I need an animal, what sort of species do I need? And um, the smaller or the lower you go, the better. And there are principles behind that, uh, the principles of the, the three R's, we call that refinement, replacement, and reduction. So if you can try, if you think you will be able to answer your question by lower species, that's obviously what you should do. Now, that is not what we did, and that's what I would like to explain. So what we wanted is that, um, is to investigate the response of pile vessels uh, to external stimuli like changing blood pressure in terms of changing diameter um, and in terms also of the uh, flow velocity of the red blood cells. Uh, and Sophie will explain uh, how we exactly do that. And there is there are a couple of cranial window models that can be used for that. Uh, and the one that was developed by Michael Daly in Tennessee and whom we got to know through the um, to, through the Glasgow group uh, who tried to model that. And actually Michael Daly also developed it, it himself to model autoregulation uh, seemed very interesting to us. So we, we took that model and um, modified it a little bit according to our needs. And what we actually wanted to do is to quickly, we thought we could do it quickly, validate PRX as an effective and accurate and, and reliable measure of the actual phenomenon of uh, pressure autoregulation. And the goal of that was to quantify confines of autoregulation in order to enable us to stratify better and do better clinical studies on that topic. So this is a large animal model and a large animal model comes with challenges. And as I just said, if, if, if you choose your topic and your research question, you should actually start or to, to think about going as low as possible, which we didn't do. So we started from an existing piglet model and another thing is that the pig is, you may like that or not, but it's closest to the human cardiorespiratory physiology in animal science. You could use monkeys as well, but and uh, subhuman primates, but that's then overshooting. So the pig is actually very well suited to answer questions that are physiological um, and have been used throughout different models. So. That's a large animal, of course, and that, and that comes with challenges. One of the challenges, and that's true for all animal research, uh, you need to have ethics board approval. There are specific uh, ethics boards in all universities that deal with that and the requirements they ask from you in terms of um, uh, providing sufficient comfort and, and avoiding 
uh, suffer for these animals are a bit higher if you, in larger animals than in uh, smaller animal and lower species. So that's obviously a first thing. And there are reporting duties associated with that. So you should, should report the number of animals you did and, and what happened in those animals. And that's just to justify that kind of uh, experimental setup. And that is, well, we have a societal uh, responsibility. So that's, that's, that's totally rightful to do that. If you do, if you work with large animals, uh, there's time investment. Each animal, each experiment is a, is a full day. It's like operating on a patient and actually you create a surgery room and an ICU uh, in your lab. Uh, and so it's not just doing a couple of experiments that doesn't work. It's, it's one day uh, per experiment. Um, the piglet is like a small patient, like a child actually. So there, there's a need for sufficient surgical expertise and also anesthesia expertise to deal with all possible problems that can happen during an experiment. And it also comes with a cost. And you see, and I won't go into detail, but there's a cost for the animals. And also for transportation, for housing them in preparation of the experiment, usually a couple of days on beforehand, for all the drugs you need, for sterilizing your instruments, for renting the OR room, etc. And so the budget we have or the cost we have is approximately 800 euros per experiment. And that does not account for the personnel. It's just for all the equipment and the animal you need. As for the uh, for the large equipment you need in that, those kind of experiments, um, we we over the past years the budget built up to uh, we spent like about one hundred and sixty thousand euros. So it's quite quite expensive um, experiments. So what we did, and I will give the word to Sophie afterwards, uh, we established the model we were happy with. Um, we pro um, produced a paper on the basic autoregulation physiology, uh, and that was uh, the best abstract last year uh, at the EANS. So we we're very happy with that. And Sophie's work is now on uh, identifying the influence of PCO2 on the uh, autoregulation curve. We worked also on ketamine influence on the autoregulation curve. And now Sophie is also adding a human-like severe TBI to that model, because as for now, it's a healthy uh, model. Usually there's many people involved of, in that kind of research. That's also true in our lab. And the other speakers will also highlight that, I think. And I would very much like to thank my collaborators. And I will now switch to Sophie. Okay. Okay, good afternoon. I will talk a little bit more in depth about our model. Um, and as discussed, our main research goal is cerebral autoregulation, uh, which we have already uh, established uh, quite a bit. And now we are looking further for confounding factors on cerebral autoregulation. And our main interest is traumatic brain injury. So as discussed, we use a PIC model and the major uh, of the largest uh, advantage of this model is that a pig has a gyrencephalic brain, uh, so it is quite comparable to the human brain. As you can see, uh, the construction is quite comparable, uh, only they have a very uh, large first nerve uh, compared to humans. So we use quite young pigs, they are seven weeks old and they weigh about 10 kilograms, um, so they are quite easy to handle. Um, the, the other advantage is that their cardiopulmonary physiology is similar to, uh, to humans. Um, which makes it during the experiment, like the blood pressure and the heart frequency is actually quite similar to a human and we can directly uh, translate it. Of course, there are some pitfalls um, in animal research and like pigs, they are actually quite prone to stress. So this is something you have to anticipate to um, in order to have a good experiment, to have a stable experiment. Also, when you're manipulating a pig, um, they quite easily develop bradi bradycardia or an AV block, um, and they are more prone to infection than humans. So our setup is, um, because of these, these pigs are prone to stress, we pre-medicate them inside their cage where they are surrounded uh, with other pigs, so they are comfortable. Then we place a vascular access in their ear and we intubate them. And then we start a sedation uh, protocol, which is also quite similar to what we use here in the ICU. We only use intravenous anesthesia um, because we know that uh, gas inhalation, uh, etc., uh, interferes uh, with vasodilation. So we place the catheter in the ear and then we place also an arterial line to measure the blood pressure. Therefore, we use a Schwann-Ganz catheter. Um, and that is simply because it's easily available to us. We can use the pediatric Schwann-Ganz, uh, which we have here. And then in our model, we would like to investigate uh, the influence of blood pressure. So we do not want to use medication for that, but we place a balloon. 
so this is a picture of the right groin of these small pigs. You can see the highest is a femoral artery, which is about the size of the MCA uh, in humans. So we place a balloon artery in the uh, thoracic aorta. When we inflate it, we will increase the afterload and this pig will become hypertensive. This way we don't have to use medication uh, to, to provoke this. Or the other way around, we place a balloon in the cavel fin. And then if we increase it, uh, if we inflate it, excuse me, um, then the preload will decrease and this pig will become hypotensive. So that was for the vascular access. Then for the cranial access, we are mostly interested in flow. Um, so we place a cranial window before the coronal suture. Um, we, we put a glass overneath it and then we put a camera uh, so we can make movies and we can measure diameters and, and measure the flow. And also, of course, we place uh, an ICP PBO2 probe. These are the romantic ones. And we place a laser Doppler flow also to estimate the flow. So this is the window. You can see it installed with a glass overneath it. And we can actually look at the cortical arteries, which is our goal. Um, we can measure the diameter. And because we uh, fluorescently label the red blood cells, we can also track them and we can estimate the velocity. So this is also the material that we use. We have a Philips monitor, which we also use in ICU, um, and we lock everything with the ICM Plus monitor. And these are actually some uh, results of my, my previous colleague who used this model also, and he was able to differ differentiate um, whether the diameter or the red blood velocity contributes the most to cerebral autoregulation, and that the plateau that is always discussed between 50 and 150 is actually uh, a, a bit less, it's, it's a bit more narrow. So then we are adding now the next step. Um, and it, quite, it was quite dif difficult to develop a TBI model. Um, and we found in the literature, actually, the only group in large animals, uh, in large pigs, they use a HIGE device. Uh, and this is a rotational impact that they, and this is the only model that we have found that can provoke actually uh, an augmentation of ICP uh, due to the rotation. And so this is actually why we have a, a custom made uh, prototype now, uh, which we are installing in, in, in our animal lab, um, which gives a very uh, rapid acceleration uh, in the sagittal plane uh, of these pigs. Uh, but this is ongoing research, uh, so we will discuss this in a later meeting. So thank you very much. And if there are questions, we were happy to answer them. So oh, thank you so much. This was so interesting. And I hope that all questions uh, can be answered at the end. I would love if you can stay online with us. If you're not, we don't have any clinical duties or commitments. So, okay, if you're staying with us, then we will please answer to the end. So the question and answers box is open. So if any has an answer or question to provide, just right in there, we go on with Professor Rostami, who's next in line. Hi. Hello. Hi. Thanks for joining us. Thank you. Sorry, I had some trouble with. Uh, let's see if I can share my screen. So do you see my screen? Excellent. So I thought I would give you just um, an overview of different types of uh, experimental models that we have. And uh, uh, I know I talked to Niklas and uh, he will cover uh, some of the ones that we have, um, uh, that we both have. <laughs> so um, I will start with uh, uh, telling you about our research in TBI. We basically try to have a translational research um, and a holistic approach to TBI, where we have models from in vitro models, where we investigate, um, uh, use different types of stem cells uh, to investigate how they respond to injury. And then we have animal models and then our clinical study and postmortem and different registry studies. So uh, based on today's topic, I will cover uh, the in vitro model and our uh, animal models that we have in rodents. So for the, for the in vitro model, uh, we basically use uh, uh, stem cells from wild type mouse and transgenic mice, and we grow the embryonic stem cells. And uh, we use um, 
uh, in vitro injury model, which is a simple scratch model that was uh, developed by Anna Erlandson at Uppsala. And you basically scratch uh, the cells that you have grown in a dish and uh, you can see how they respond to injury dependent on the genetic background and also use it as uh, different types of uh, drug um, testing assays that you can have. And we use this setup also for uh, iPSC cells from uh, humans, uh, from TBI patients that we know uh, have specific genetic um, uh, background and we know how they respond to injury and we try to understand uh, that uh, using this in vitro model and also test different types of drug to see how the response of uh, different types of um, cells are to this. And uh, for the TBI models, uh, we mainly have three different types of uh, rodent models. Uh, the first one that I uh, don't work uh, so much myself is a BLAST TBI model. And the second one is a penetrating injury model and that uh, I will talk about, and then the rotational TBI model. So basically what the goal is to try to mimic different types of um, TBI and understand the uh, underlying pathology. Uh, and the, um, these are usually used uh, for rats, but we also uh, can adjust the rigs to use them for mice. Uh, so when it comes to the penetrating injury model, uh, if you look at the first picture with uh, the schematic presentation of the uh, model, you have the animal and then you have a piston which will uh, like shoot like a bullet into um, something that has different types of pins that you can use. So you can decide if you want to have um, a very sharp and small um, injury cavity or you want a more blunt type of injury. And uh, so um, uh, you will get a very focal injury where you have a lesion and a large cavity um, and you will have um, uh, the systemic blood um, in the pathology. Uh, uh, so it's a very specific type of injury you create. It's also gradable, so you can have, um, uh, you cannot maybe call it mild to severe, but you can adjust the cavity that you create the injury. And it's also a very uh, nice model for different types of treatment. Uh, this is a from um, uh, one of the papers that uh, uh, they used injection of different types of drug in the area, in the cavity, and then they studied how the area around the cavity responded to injury. And the, there are several different uh, drugs tested with this type of um, uh, model. So if you're interested, you can uh, look into that and or ask me some question about it later. Uh, then we have also this rotational TBI model, which is which mimics uh, a more diffuse axonal injury. It's a closed uh, head type of TBI. So the uh, rat uh, or the mice is um, uh, fixed into this uh, bar and you have this um, uh, bullet or a piston that hits the, um, the beam that the uh, animal is fixed to. So the beam so the, there is no impact to the head of the rat. It just creates a rotational injury, acceleration, deceleration. And um, uh, so it's, um, and it's also gradable. So you can have mild and you can have very severe. So you create, um, I mean, histologically, you can see that you have uh, beta APP expression in particularly in the areas of corpus callosum. Uh, and, um, uh, what is nice about this model is that uh, it's uh, gradable, so you can adjust how uh, we could say how hard you hit the rats. So you could have very mild injury uh, that you can see with the expression expression of the beta APP uh, and also uh, biomarkers in the blood, um, and uh, you can have more severe. So we. we measure both in the blood and the CSF, and you can see that you, you, can, you have increase of CSF injury biomarkers up to two weeks. But when you look at, um, if, you, if you grade it at, at the lower end, 
and you look at different types of behavior study, you see that they do have these um, type of graphs are, for example, for um, uh, memory, anxiety, et cetera. So what uh, we could see was that they had transient um, uh, memory disturbances and anxiety, but it's very mild. And usually it's uh, after three to five days, it's like gone. So it's really um, a good uh, model for um, mild TBI. And also you could uh, uh, use for repetitive mild TBI. And then there is this BLAST TBI model that is available. And uh, I don't know if you are familiar, but the Iraq-Afghanistan war really put this on the map, the BLAST injury, the soldiers were not really having visible injuries of injuries that was could be seen by uh, normal imaging, but they had really symptoms. Um, and um, um, they were, the hypothesis were that, it, or they knew that they were hit by this uh, waves from BLAST, um, different types of explosions. So different types of blast injury TBI model was developed. And this one is basically that they put the rat, it's like fixed uh, here. And then you have the uh, detonation and you explode and the rat is hit by this wave. And then you study how um, the brain, you could also study the lungs, etc. But the focus here is with the uh, TBI, how it responds to this type of uh, injury. And there've been extensive research done on this one. Uh, and what we basically have done is try to, uh, uh, for example, with using different types of mRNA, mRNA expression or gene expression to see the differences between these uh, three types of injury. And uh, what this graph mimics is that you have different types of functional uh, gene groups that are activated in a different way, depending on what type of uh, TBI you produce. Um, and uh, of course, in, in the clinical settings, you usually have a mix of these uh, types of injury, but um, in the uh, experimental models, you could have these clean cut types of injury that you can study. And uh, we can also study the type of lesion, the, the, the cavity, uh, the, the electron microscopy could detect different types of edema depending on, on what type of injury you were looking at. Um, so it's very useful if you have specific uh, question for this specific type of injury. For example, if you're interested in diffuse axonal injury, then the rotational TBI model is very useful. Um, you could also, uh, this, um, this is, for example, where we try to map the beta APP expression, the axonal injuries in the rotational TBI model and the penetrating in, uh, injury model. This is the area close to the cavity, and this is uh, the area at the corpus callosum that we could see. Uh, although it, it, it is a mild type of TBI, the axonal injury is, um, uh, is extensive. Uh, and you can also map, uh, for example, uh, different inflammatory response in this uh, type of injury. And these are pictures for, uh, for uh, complement factors, which is a part of the immune system. And uh, what we could see that the distribution of, uh, of uh, the inflammatory response is different between penetrating and rotational TBI model. And it's just an example how you can uh, use different types of model to assess uh, different underlying pathology in TBI. So this was my last slide. And uh, if you have any further question or more detailed question, please let me know. Thank you. Thank you to you, Professor. It was very interesting. And I have a lot of questions for later. So <laughs> even if, uh, if all the others, uh, for now, there is nothing in the question and answer spot, but We'll keep going. Dr. Yunsi, are you there? Yes. Yes, gonna share my, uh, my screen. Yes. Okay, should be visible. So, Perfect. um, Thank you uh, for the invitation and for the really great lectures so far. Um, I'll try to give a little bit my perspective on, um, uh, as a rather younger neurotrauma researcher, how to actually uh, start this kind of research and to start a lab, so to speak. So uh, these are my thoughts. I'm curious what you will say and what we will discuss later on. 
So um, a little bit uh, background information. Our lab um, in Heidelberg um, is focused on de developing experimental uh, treatments for spinal cord injury primarily and also at uh, TBI. And we started with in vivo experiments as you will uh, see later on. And uh, we do a lot of in vitro work as well nowadays. Um, we, we are quite young, so we established this in 2016, part of our department. And um, the team is uh, growing. It was really small at the beginning. And now we uh, have a lot of, uh, of several uh, students and also medical staff members from our department. Um, um, I would say now a wide range of models and methods through a lot of uh, collaborations, some funding, and we try to be active and uh, publish and be present on conferences, what I think everybody tries to do. So um, I want to tell you a little bit the story how um, we uh, I started with this kind of research. So uh, again, I'm a neurosurgeon. And um, in 2016, one of my former attendings, um, Professor Zeckberger, friend and colleague, who's now chief of neurosurgery in Braunschweig, he came back from a stay abroad uh, at Michael Feeling's lab in Toronto. Probably a lot of you are very familiar with his work, and he was uh, motivated to do a project on his own. And um, I was a resident at the time, and I had a colleague, good friend, and we were very interested in doing uh, this kind of lab work. Uh, we had some knowledge on our doctoral thesis, uh, but uh, beside that, no previous experience with new trauma research or models. And we um, had a lot of support by Professor Unibeck, my uh, the head of my department. Uh, I'm very uh, thankful for um, who is a specialist in new trauma research himself. And he was, I think, happy to support this young group. And then we, uh, yeah, we decided we want to do a project it started with one project, and this is the project I'm going to talk about, and uh, try uh, form the lab with three members, basically. And um, yeah, I want to give you, uh, in retrospect, a little bit the steps uh, that it took us to uh, yeah to start this work, this this first project, and maybe this is helpful for some of the listeners uh, who are interested to uh, to do a same similar thing or. Yeah, to start their own uh, research project in uh, lab potentially. So uh, obviously the first uh, question is, um, what do you want to research? What, what is the, the focus of, what is your interest? And uh, either you have somebody who is a specialist already, he tells you what you could do, but in our case, so we went into a lot of reading. Obviously that's what everybody should do. PubMed uh, search on spinal cord injury. We wanted to do spinal cord injury. I was really interested in spinal cord injuries in your trauma and then new regeneration. So how to regenerate lost tissue and a lost function. Uh, if you see those patients, I don't have to tell you, then uh, you know that uh, this is something really important that has a lot of uh, treatments lacking. So uh, a lot of hits in PubMed, you need to do some deep dives, you read more into one direction, the other direction, uh, you look a lot at the cross references and uh, it became clear that we are most interested in stem cells, so less hits and, then um, uh, due to uh, obvious reasons for the, maybe people who work with those kind of cells, we come to the conclusion that we are interested in doing some research with a neural precursor cells. We want to use uh, NPCs for spinal cord uh, injury treatment. So uh, in this step, I think uh, uh, looking back, it was really uh, important to collect and manage all relevant publications. So you should probably start with a publication manager uh, straight from the beginning. And what is really, um, uh, I, I think, good is if you read so much, especially in the beginning phase, then uh, you uh, should use this, uh, all this knowledge and publications together to maybe, if you have a very specific uh, research question later on, to um, use it for writing a review, actually. And then another thing I realized is this is science. So usually people are quite friendly and open. If you contact authors, because you know all the publications do not always I speak the truth and there's a lot of questions uh, around what is published you can contact people and they answer you and they even send you stuff sometimes so this is uh, i think quite efficient um another thing that uh, i did and that i think is very uh, uh good uh, crucial as well is to attend conferences and events and lectures and webinars like ours now um it's now easier than ever obviously with all the virtual stuff uh you know to get ideas as well and i want to do a little bit of publicity on for our 
uh, not our, but for the INTS biannual meeting that is gonna take place this year in uh, Berlin. And we from our department uh, are organizing, organizing it with uh, Professor Plessina from Munich and uh, Professor Zickberger from uh, Braunschweig. So uh, feel free to look at the conference website uh, to ask questions. So this is supposed to be very good conference for new trauma research. Another thing that I did myself as well, and um, uh, I think that it was also very helpful is to visit uh, a lab that is already existing or uh, an, an op do an observership in a regroup that is very active. So I went to Toronto as well to my feelings lab, uh, just uh, not so long, but just to get some insights. And um, uh, I'd like to invite everybody who's interested in doing this here in Germany, in Heidelberg, to contact me. Um, we'll talk about it later on as well, but this is always uh, possible. Come and have a look at what we do and uh, learn from people who did a little bit uh, more than you did. Uh, so I did the same, and I think it was really helpful. And then there's a lot of discussion, obviously, with uh, the peers within the department and also with other researchers on the campus. And at the end, for our first project, beginning of our lab, we uh, came to the conclusion our research question should be, can we improve neuroregeneration after experimental spinal cord injury by transplanting NPCs? And um, next step was to actually make a plan and make a concept. And this is quite difficult. So um, looking back, I would say, uh, look, um, you know, start from the end and think about what, how you want to measure uh, the effect of your treatment. So in our case, treatment uh, should be NPCs, neural precursor cells. How, do, how would we like to measure it? And then you have, a, uh, you, you, have uh, you look at all the possible outcome measures. And for our experiment, uh, we decided to uh, use the uh, BBB score as a primary um, functional outcome measurement. The catwalk gate analysis, another um, fairly objective um, uh, outcome assessment tool for rodents, especially, and a grid walk test. So uh, you have this set of neuro tests and uh, we have a primary outcome measure. Um, and then we decided we want to um, assess uh, the spinal cord injury and potential treatment effects with MRI as well. We want to do a retrograde fiber labeling. So we had to uh, you know, collect data on those outcome measures. And then the mainstay of our uh, tissue analysis should be just immune histochemistry, immune fluorescence. So with this uh, set of outcome measures, you can take the next, next step, my opinion, and decide what kind of injury you want to do. Um, this is from zero, right? You didn't do anything before. So you have to learn every, everything from scratch. So we looked at the injury models. Obviously, we went uh, to market feedings in Toronto and they used the uh, clip compression confusion injury model a lot. And um, we decided we want to use the same. So this is uh, the fairly uh, common, commonly used uh, clip compression confusion injury. You uh, do a laminectomy. In our case, we wanted to do a cervical one just because we thought if we do, we do it cervically because this is where most injuries happen and this is where treatment would be most beneficial. So basically you perform a cervical laminectomy. We chose the C6 level, not too high, not too low. And then you, uh, you apply a clip with a const, uh, constant clip force for one minute, the same surgeon all the time. And you can actually see the contusion compression injury here on the spinal cord. And um, this then defines uh, the group design. So in our first project, we, um, we had a treatment group, the NPC group, and obviously a, a placebo group, a vehicle group, and a sham group. Um, so this is how you could design your first experiment as well. Next step was to um, specify the treatment, in our case, the NPC transplantation. So you have to think about how you get the cells. Uh, in our case, we later on um, created a primary NPC cell line ourselves. And then you have to um, you know, assess the tripotency of the cells. You have to look at the viability. Um, so this is all stuff that you have to read and uh, put into your plan before you even start. And uh, you have to think about how you want to transplant the cells. We chose an injection, serotactic injection uh, with a Hamilton syringe, as you can see here. And then the, trans, the, the cell graft is actually really uh, transplanted. So this happened all later on, obviously. And then a uh, very important part, uh, calculate the necessary group size. And also take into account uh, rates of mortality and error mortality in those models um, can be quite high, especially in rodents and cervical spinal cord injury. 
And then um, next step uh, for me is always to create a timeline. Uh, one of uh, the timeline for our first project looked like this. Uh, you also have to define how long you want to assess the treatment effects. So in our case, uh, 56 days. And if you have all this ready, um, uh, and you should collect all the information together uh, while conceptualizing and planning your experiment all the time, note, down, uh, note the producer, the supplier, the quantity, dose, concentration, price, because it will really help you later on if you go shopping for this. And then at the end, you combine everything into a, um, a written project proposal and you outline in detail what you want to do because you, now you've made up your plan. And this is typically also the basis for uh, animal, animal ethic applications, grant applications, et cetera. So you, if you have done this, it's all the theoretical work. Um, I think you're ready to, uh, to move to the next step, which is, uh, and uh, the previous uh, speakers have talked about this, have touched this, which is, I think, acquire, to acquire funding, because this kind of research uh, also with rodents can get quite expensive. And um, in my opinion, what you should do, uh, you should screen local sources uh, first, because it's sometimes really surprising how many, you know, also smaller grants, local grants are available. We found a um, an innovation fund from the local um, interdisciplinary neurobehavioral core facility of our university, and we got. I mean, we can talk about this. We got a grant of five thousand euros from them, and we applied uh, for a little bigger, little bit bigger uh, grant on a, uh, I would say, international level. Um, uh, from the cervical spinal uh, cervical spinal research society, and that's uh, something. If you apply for funding for the first time, it's quite crucial. And if you haven't done it before, you should get some help. For our first um, uh, grant proposal, we got a little bit of help from Toronto as well. And uh, I know some people who also uh, use um, professional uh, agencies. So depending on what you aim for, this might be helpful. Uh, for our first project, we uh, were able to get another 30,000 euros approximately. So this is the overall um, budget that we had. And uh, this is su obviously sufficient for this kind of project. Um, my, my honest uh, uh, opinion is to apply for everything possible. Also the smallest, you know, poster prizes. I try to get everything because um, you will need this kind you will need the money and if you plan you experiment and you have a higher error rate or if you have uh, other problems and you need additional materials uh consumables and you run out of cash in the project that's terrible so you have to have this kind of backup so um yeah apply for everything that you can get and these are some examples that we um at least for our german uh, audience um yeah would maybe I suggest so uh, the spinal and the neurosurgical societies, the, uh, the German uh, Science Foundation, of course, and then some European um, and also international uh, uh, agencies. And uh, there's the uh, Hannelore Kohl Stiftung in Germany, open for funding for TBI research, especially as well. Then next step for us, because we started from from scratch, is to find partners. Why? Because if you do this kind of uh, new trauma experiment exper um, for the first time on your own, you run into a lot of problems. Many of the methods, techniques, uh, first of all, require costly equipment, and you just can't afford it with the money you just uh, acquired. It's impossible. Then um, if you don't have a lab space, which we didn't, which if you start, you probably don't have as well, uh, to just rent space um, for any kind of experiment is really difficult. There's just no space. Or it's, or it's expensive. Then uh, the more complex methods in vivo and in vitro, they have a lot of, uh, you, you have to have experience, they have a long learning curve. And if you have somebody who can properly guide you and explain uh, to you, that helps a lot. And um, what you have to realize is that even with the best plan, best planning, there will be for the first experiment, especially countless challenges. And if you have somebody you can talk to who's a little bit more experienced, not necessarily in the new trauma field, but in general, uh, research, then th this is really helpful. So don't do it on your own. If you are uh, in a uh, situation like we were, Heidelberg University is a huge campus. There are a lot of facilities, a lot of ins uh, labs and institutions. I'm sure that if you're nice and polite, you will find somebody who will do research with you. 
Um, and um, yeah, those researchers could potentially provide intellectual input during the planning phase already, could continuously discuss everything you do with you. Um, in our case, this was important. You can get cost-free or cost-reduced materials, equipment, lab space. In Hardebeck, we have core facilities that really offer this kind of service to young researchers or to researchers who don't have the means yet. Uh, you can get practical support um, for you know learning the methods, for example. And um, you can also get better access to additional grants funding. And if you have one collaborator, it's easier to get another one. So you can essentially form a network for yourself. Uh, and this helps for future experiments a lot. So just briefly in our case, I also want to, uh, to, say, to thank Professor Scutella, who uh, was our first collaborator, partner, and became a very, very solid and constant research partner for our team and lab um, from the Department of Anatomy and Neuroanatomy uh, from Heidelberg University. So uh, he and his team helped us a lot with the neuronal precursor cell generation and in vitro work. And then we um, uh, were very lucky to have Dr. Claudia Pizza on board. She is the head of the local uh, behavioral assessment facility, and uh, we were able to rent space there and get a lot of uh, help with the neuro tests. And also, we uh, got some space where we could do the first surgeries uh, as well, and uh, we could where we where the animals essentially lived and had their cages. And then in later experiments, just briefly, um, you you meet new people, and we have um, some other collaborators that I just want to name and thank. Um, uh, uh, because they in also other experiments help us a lot and still do. So important. Next step, form a bigger team or form a team. So we started with two residents. We were very, very uh, lucky to um, get two doctoral students. And um, this kind of project, um, spinal cord injury, cervical, uh, 50 animals, um, uh, eight weeks approximately. It's a, it's a lot of work, and uh, not only the preparation, but actually really doing the experiment. And um, you have you need more hands, or you have to be a, yeah a crazy worker. Also, you have to have time, obviously. So this is another aspect. Um, you cannot do it only at night and on the weekend. So we were very uh, lucky to have two, those two doctoral students, and this I think is maybe even the most important step to find people uh, that you can motivate them, that are motivated themselves, that grow with you. And those guys, for example, although we started from zero, they were um, trusting us and investing in our little group. And uh, with them, we pulled off the first experiment. And then the, with, with every new ex uh, experiment and project, uh, obviously the team grows and is growing. And I'm really thankful to all of those um, residents and doctoral students and interns and uh, PhDs um, to um, to be there to help and to to do this kind of work together and uh, as you probably can imagine uh, I mean it's typically young motivated groups so there's a lot of social interaction as well and if people are obviously if they are happy and work happily together then this is very fruitful for this kind of research as well. Next step, uh, so this is just for your information, uh, who is doing what in our, in our group, but not so important. Uh, you have to establish the models and methods. And before you actually start the first experiment, you have to be able to uh, you know, perform the methods uh, and to, to master the model appropriately. Otherwise, you have a lot of bias when you do, for example, the surgeries and even other smaller things like animal handling and care. So that's all the stuff you have to train or get trained in. So how to handle the animals, how to perform the, uh, the, the basic basis of your uh, research, the clip compression contusion SCI in our case, small stuff like how to manually squeeze a red bladder um, because they can pee after the cervical SCI, how to do injections and how to transplant the cells and so on. So there's a lot of, of things to learn. This uh, is usually done at night on the weekends, um, but uh, if you reach a certain plateau, then you're ready to actually start the experiment. You also have to be um, able to do the preparation stuff in our case, to generate the NPCs, to culture them, to properly assess them. And then you also have to uh, train a little bit the neuro tests and uh, you have to get uh, accustomed with the tissue analysis. So when the experiment is over, the red is sacrificed. It goes on, right? So you have to perfuse the animals, you have to 
prepare the tissue properly. You, in our case, you have to do cryosectioning, you have to do the antibody stainings, um, depending on what you want to do. And then it doesn't stop there. You also have to do imaging analysis. Uh, you have to learn how to use a laser scanning microscope, maybe some imaging software, and then statistical analysis as well. So this is all still part of the fairly practical preparation. And then, um, yeah, you start the work. And uh, yeah, in our case, so this, again, again, the first project, very intense. So you do, um, as you can see here, you do uh, nice things together as well. And there's a lot of documentation and uh, the, the rats, uh, when you do it the first time, you sometimes also feel sad because they're injured. And um, yeah, so it's an intense, and I would um, recommend it to everybody. It's It's still a really, a nice experience to do this kind of work and you feel like you're really doing something. And then essentially, uh, if you've done it, uh, you can hopefully publish it. And obviously that's the goal um, that everybody has. So this is the publication for our first project, just as an example. And um, so this is one, one project, one experiment, but um, th th so the thing is that from there on, you have to continue. And uh, what I can recommend is that if you, just before you finish the first experiment and you, you have nice results and you are happy and you're motivated, um, plan the next one already, um, create the next team already and use this overlap time to, uh, you know, to teach the new team members with the ongoing project. And um, uh, by doing this uh, during the last years, we were able to do one experiment after the other. Um, just some examples, we, I mean, just, we worked with uh, mpc derived exosomes, Currently, we work with uh, viral vectors that we try to use for cellular reprogramming in uh, vitro and in vivo. So, you know, skip the, the cells. That's a little bit the goal. We try to use treadmill training to enhance NPC transplantation. We tried growth factors to enhance NPC transplantation. We tried stabilizators of the BSCB, so just drugs, immune ventilators. And um, I think that's what you would do then as well. If you do one project, it really gets uh, you know the stone rolling and um, you can continue and then you can call it uh, a lab later on uh, and it also feels like a lab and sometimes like a family okay so that's from that is that's it from my side uh, kind of emotional talk as well thank you for your attention and looking forward to your questions thanks dr Yurinci. amazing so off to Professor Markland. So we have lots of questions already, so we'll keep going. And in the end, we will do all, all the questions all together. Thanks for bearing with us. So let's see, um, do you see my presentation? So you see one one screen? No. Oh, it's closed, okay, so one no, screen. No, no. So I should um, move this one. Okay, let's see. Oh, come on. Can I stop this one? Try again. Let's see. Mm-hmm, sure. I don't know why it's not working, sorry. Come on. It typically works every time, let's see then. Okay, excuse me. I, I think you can perhaps close the PowerPoint altogether yes. for a second. Yeah, exactly. I'll, I'll do that and I will open it again. Anyway, first of all, I'm, I'm grateful for the ENS, of course, and for Laura Lippa for making this happening. And I'm also very happy that so many are still here. So, and now really hope that this can work. Um, Now, I hope. Yes, it's perfect. 
Okay. Yes, perfect. Sorry about that. All right, I will share with you some of my thoughts on the translation of studies of white matter injury in Chiba. It's sort of a passion and a huge interest of mine. I do think the white matter injuries are key in TBI. And I will share some experience that I have that's quite similar to what Alexander Junsi just showed you. But as you know, everything we do in research starts with, with a problem. And of course, it's TBI. It's named the most complex disease known to man in the most complex organ in the body, as you know. And those of you who are clinicians and work with this, you know that TBI is not one disease. There are very many different disorders that can be complex due to any other comorbidities and age and gender and everything like that. And I'm particularly concerned about what you see, uh, sorry, about the white matter. First of all, TBI is not one event. It's an ongoing disorder. And we know that TBI will accelerate brain aging and you actually lose brain volume to the extent of Alzheimer's disease patient if you have a severe TBI. And this is particularly pronounced in the white matter. Of course, if you have white matter injury or axonal injury, you get network dysfunction. So many of the symptoms that patients will experience uh, or the problems the patients have after TBI is related to uh, axonal or white matter problems and impairment of the function. Furthermore, the white matter injury in TBI seems to be a crucial link to neurodegeneration. Uh, you probably know that TBI is a well-established risk factor for dementia, uh, Parkinson's disease, and others. Uh, we can call it neurodegeneration, or we can call it uh, TBI-induced encephalopathy. This is more of sort of the more severe TBIs. Um, I also have a huge interest in sports-related uh, related concussions. This is a mild traumatic injury. You get it by rapid head rotation. And the key with this clinical problem is many of these get repeated injuries. And one of the many problems there's associated with this is that the outcome is worse in women. Uh, I'll come back to that later, but some of these athletes will develop persistent symptoms. Some develop neurodegeneration at a relatively young age, and some may even get this chronic traumatic encephalopathy, the CTE that's characterized by aggregation of phosphorylated uh, tau. And just briefly, we have a cohort of um, um, young, rather healthy athletes. They have persistent symptoms after of typically several concussions. And we use seven Tesla MRI to them. This is briefly showing that everything you see in bright color here is white matter abnormalities used in DTI and particularly DKI for those of you who know your MRI. I will come back to this. Well, what is this really? In another cohort that I've been following, persistent symptoms, we actually see here, here's the, the top row here. So you see some orange dots here. This pathological aggregation of tau in 25 year old athletes. They also have some neuroinflammation. And if we can compare that to TBI, TBI, young TBI patients also have more substantial tau aggregation and they have more neuroinflammation at the chronic phase, more than six months post-injury. So I use some method to study clinical TBI. Don't worry, I will get back to the experimental side. We do a lot of neurocritical care um, studies. We have advanced neuromonitoring, neuroimaging, uh, everything like that. A lot of biomarker studies. And we do a quite extensive follow-up on these. And what I think is also very important that we discuss experimental TBI is have something to compare with. And so I established a, a, a tissue bank for humans, like a fresh surgically resected human brain tissue from these severe and terrible TBIs that we had to remove surgically. So we actually the first to do some proteomics on fresh um, human tissue and TBI and also on the epigenetic studies uh, uh, when we use this, um, this tissue bank. Sports concussion is just totally different stories, much less severe injuries. I have a follow cohorts of um, young but uh, symptomatic athletes, persistent symptoms for more than six months. We do a bunch of things with them, detailed neuropsychology, tau PETs, seven Tesla MRI, balance testing, etc. And we also do uh, fluid biomarkers on them. Combined, I create a hypothesis like this. I do think that TBI and or the sports-related concussion 
they, they are risk factors for neurodegeneration. And why is that? Well, I think you get axonal and white matter injury. You get oligodendrocyte problems. You get demyelination, et cetera. Together, you will also get vascular dysfunction. You get tau aggregation. Um, and you have this oligodendrocyte problems. And then the inflammation will also be involved in this. Um, but this is very detailed hypothesis. How can I test that? I cannot do that in humans. So then you obviously need the animals, the, the rodent models of TBI. And I did my PhD thesis on experimental TBI. I went to the US to do a two year postdoc on experimental TBI. So I spent maybe too much time in my life on animal models of, of TBI. And there's uh, some good chapters in this book as well, if, you, uh, if you're interested in this. I'll mention a few of them because this slide again, the most complex uh, disease is more than one disease. And then obviously to mimic these uh, different types of TBI, you, you do need one uh, more than one TBI model as well, obviously. Uh, I need to mention when we talk about rodents and humans, obviously there are huge difference in, in brain size, anatomy, lysencephalic rodent versus carencephalic humans. Uh, so there's non, a number of issues that you need to consider before you say this is clinically relevant. This actually when we talk um, about rodents, they have less white matter content relative to the size of the brain than humans have, for instance. But still, there are similarities in how vulnerable they are, and also some key events happen also both in human TBI as it does in the rodents. And there are many studies, just one example. We know that humans get post-traumatic epilepsy, particularly if it's severe, particularly if it's penetrating. And yes, rodent, using the rodent models, they also get post-traumatic epilepsy. Um, brilliant work by Asla Pitkin in, in Finland. So there are many, I can do, do this forever, saying that there are relevant uh, changes in the rodent that will mimic uh, the human conditions. So back to the axon, it's a lot about its connectivity to other regions, but also the transport of proteins and factors back and forth uh, in the axon. If it's injured, we get APP accumulation, and this classical axonal retraction bulbs, you get this, the, you can make all in varicosities, uh, disrupted axonal transport. You see, that, you see this in human TBI, and you see it in rodent TBI. So we need ways of mimicking um, this disorder also in, in the experimental setting. And Bartet Pretier showed how they do it in, in the pig. And Elam shows how we do it, how they do it with the rotational models. Many use this one, the impact acceleration model. It's called the Marmaru model. One limitation of this, you cannot use this in, uh, um, in the mouse. It's typically, typically used in, um, in the rats only. So I've chosen, uh, chosen other models, and these are my favorite ones. This is the CCI, the controlled cortical impact, and the fluid percussion injury. As briefly mentioned, the CCI, um, it's super easy. You need to drill, be able to drill a hole using the microscope, and then you attach the pneumatically driven piston, and you get a rapid impact to the, to the brain of, of the rodent. It's a very, very common. I would say this is the most widely distributed um, uh, rodent model of TBI. But maybe this injury is a little too big, huge injury like this. So maybe it's less clinically relevant. Uh, it has many positive things as well. But I've chosen to, to focus more on other models. But the same with CCI, it is more than a focal model. It's, this is not like stroke. It's basically showing this is, this is um, staining for neurodegeneration, ipsilateral, but over time after seven days, it will spread towards the other side. So you, you do get contralateral changes and you do get diffuse changes as well. But what I like more is the fluid percussion injury. It's a 22 millisecond injury pulse like this, you get brain deformation and it mimics many things that you may observe in, in human uh, TBI as well. You can do it, you can place the cranial ottoman laterally and you get more of a contusion-like injury or mixed model, some axonal injury, some contusions, or you can place it in the midline like this and get more of a pure axonal injury model. That's a central or midline fluid percussion injury. 
Uh, I went myself to the US to the lab of Professor John Pavlishok, the editor of Journal of Trauma for many years, to learn to do this. I brought it back, back home to Sweden. You see up here, you need to drill a hole over the cytosol sinus in the mouse. Obviously, you can understand this is rather tricky surgery. Then you put the cement around it and put this sort of hub of a needle over this craniotomy. You fill it with, uh, with um, fluid, typically saline, that you attach to this, uh, this device. By letting this pendulum swing, you will get an injury pulse transmitted through the fluid in the cylinder, and that's transmitted then into the, the, the brain of the rodent. That is a midline uh, fluid percussion injury. It gives apnea, it gives seizures, you get a lot of behavioral deficits, and you can, you can grade it. And what's good, it can be used both rats and mice. On the, on the downside, it's a difficult surgery. You get some, some bleeding, you get some mortality from the injury itself. And also this is not clinically, clinically relevant in, in the sense that you do not get this long-term coma that the fusics only in your patient may have. But histologically, it's, it's very good. Uh, we did studies of very complex behavioral change. We put them in this, this like box with different paths uh, a rodent can choose. So typically, they would avoid an uh, open space and you know how risk taking are they, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. We can do detailed behavioral analysis. And if you do a neurotrauma lab, think very thoroughly what types of behavioral analysis you would use. You need something for cognition. You need something for motor function, balance function, et cetera. And you need something for more complex behaviors. I also spent too much time in my life writing this um, uh, review uh, together with my previous PhD student, but it's um, you know, a little, lot of different models enlisted in, uh, in this paper. So we used uh, these models, the fluid percussion models to look for white matter injuries. So there's other components to it, it's not only the axon, Obviously, the smiling, myelin is produced by the oligodendrocytes. And strangely, that was kind of forgotten in, in experimental TBI research, not so much out there, but we started looking into it and we had this, if I can say it myself, a pretty good thesis coming out use, uh, studying this. Oligodendrocytes, of course, they're interesting and they keep uh, myelinating and developing the CNS until we're around 30 years old. And each oligodendrocyte may myelinate more than 50 axons each. And you do have some other beneficial things in the brain. So I think they're important. And I want to look at this translationally, which I think is a way forward in TBI. We have the clinical studies, we do experimental research. So just very briefly, we saw that oligodendrocytes die after TBI in the rat, like this, fluid percussion models. We can see that we provide an anti-inflammatory treatment, interleukin-1 beta, neutralization antibody. We will reduce the loss of mature oligodendrocytes. So that means we maybe we can rescue these um, um, dying oligodendrocytes. We can also show in those rodent models that we see proliferation of the, the oligodendrocyte precursor cells. Maybe can, they can replace the, the dying mature oligodendrocytes in a way, a brain repair thing that's happening. But of course, this is rodent, this is rats and mice. Is this relevant to, um, to humans? Well, back to my brain bank tissue again. Very injured tissue in many ways, difficult to work with. But just using that, we see, yes, also in human TBI, oligodendrocytes, they die during the first week post injury. And we can also see that we have increased number of oligodendrocyte progenitors going back and forth between the, the clinics and the um, an experimental setting. And we can elaborate on this rather complex um, uh, hypothesis. Many factors are involved here, of course. Um, you have the TBI, we have microglia, we may uh, influence this by um, treatment, interleukin neutralized antibody, for instance. And how this involved with the axon and the inflammation, the oligodendrocytes and the path to neurodegeneration. I think this is probably one of the key aspects of, of the TBI pathophysiology that we, we can address and we can target that pharmacologically. Go back to the problem again. We saw this 
seven Tesla, DKI, a lot of change. Everything in yellow here is significantly altered white matter tracks throughout the brain of other uh, of, of otherwise healthy individuals. What are the DKI changes really mean? Speculated, maybe acetylglial changes. It can be what they call axonal varicosities. We don't know, this is humans. So we go back to the lab. We do this white matter injury model, central fluid percussion injury. We look transsynaptically, and you see here very beautifully this uh, axonal varicosity, disrupted transport in the axons like this. Then done on the tissue cleared um, um, brains from, from a mouse TBI. So maybe we can start understanding what we see in humans by using experimental models. Of course, we have the, the small animal, 9.4 test animal MRI. We've done a lot of things already. We haven't done DKI, but now when we have these findings in the, in the humans, we will go back to the lab and do it in the mouse and really go into detail what it really means. So I guess that's um, um, the, a way to work with the uh, translation, translational aspects. So basically our approach to experimental TBI, this is a, you know, not an event, it's an ongoing disorder. So we have um, animals that we have followed up to one and a half years, those injuries, which is a very long time in the rodent. And we do injuries to the very young, to the aging and really old. We've done injuries to those who are almost two years old. Look for male, female differences, um, detailed for, uh, behavioral analysis, of course. And we use this to, um, to evaluate pharmacological treatments. You can look for MRI, get beautiful tractography images like this, how the exonal pathology is evolving over time. We are working in vitro these days as well. And one focus is exonal injury mechanisms. And not least, as I mentioned briefly, the CTE, tau pathology. This is two up to 30 days post-injury we see phospholated tau increases. And it's been speculated that TBI is a prion-like disorder. When once you start getting phospholated tau, it will just continue to evolve and grow and become more and more aggregated uh, over time. So just briefly, how to do experimental TBI research. I will connect to what Alexander was just briefly referring to. Personal view. Yes, you need to learn the models, of course, all this assessment. And I would argue do it early in your career. Later as a neurosurgeon, you will simply not have the time to do it. And go to see other labs. I've done it myself many times. And get your ideas in the clinical setting. Get to, you know, see what's happening in the clinic. Go back to the bench and, you know, back and forwards. And that's really translational work. And really refine animal models. Those are not clinicians. I get the feeling that they, they don't think in the clinical way. You should have a clinical eye when designing your studies to make, him, make them as clinically relevant as uh, possible. And as mentioned, you need the co-works devoted to different aspects. And you need collaboration using your social skills. I have collaborations with uh, experts in mitochondrial analysis. I cannot do that myself. Simply have no time for that particular imaging, special techniques, uh, et cetera. And when, when it's possible, try to do, uh, take the key findings from your lab to the humans and make translation the key aspect of your, of your uh, research. But there are obstacles as well. If your neurosurgeon scientists want to do this, the older I get, the more I think this is a problem. Administration, 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 it's, it's a killer, honestly. It takes so much time, and it's, it seems to be getting worse. But if you find your way around that, um, you need funding. Uh, many agencies are really interested in translational research, but when it comes to practical and sort of details, maybe I'm not that experimental that should be awarded, or maybe I'm not that clinical since I try to do both. So um, I have, have the feeling we don't get as much um, research funds that may be we deserve, perhaps. Then obviously as a surgeon, time is, is a limiting factor sometimes, but it's, it's often it's worth it because it keeps your curiosity going and you can do a lot of um, interesting studies that help the patients in the future. So well, before I end, we are evolving and starting this organization, European Neurotra Neurotrauma Organization, will be formally be launched at the INTS meeting in Berlin this summer. 
We are also launching the website very soon. So please note it, europeanneurotrauma.org. It's not up and running yet, but I hope it will be up in you know, a couple of weeks or so. And huge thanks to all my clinical and experiment collaborators and some and a lot of thanks for my funding agencies as well. So thanks and I'm happy to take any questions you may have. So thanks, I will stop my sharing. So I can't be thankful enough for this webinar. I am um, elated to have so many participants sticking with us up until the end. Um, we have uh, a few questions, but the, the point is that in this webinar, um, the speakers were the chair, co-chair, former chair, and a neurotrauma lab director, and a PhD student in neurotrauma. So you have the very best of possibilities to get all your questions uh, answered. And uh, I think we are very lucky to have you all here uh, for, it was very instructional actually, uh, for myself in first. So one of the questions that came up from a couple of people is that, uh, is regarding how does a medical student or when is the right time for a medical student or young neurosurgeon or young resident or later resident to start with uh, lab uh, collaboration and how to reach out. So this is a question I want all of you with, uh, with experience to, to answer. So I say, I saw that Dr. Yunti already answered that uh, to one to one question uh, regarding uh, the my, the most appropriate time to to join uh, translational research. Uh, no, I can just I can just say ah for the Markland. I know you you can start. Go ahead. I already wrote some a long story. <laughs> Uh, just my perspective. So uh, uh, it's probably never too late, but maybe uh, sometimes a little bit too early. So if you're um, just a really fresh young resident and you just get uh, accustomed with the clinical duties, it can be intense. And uh, I started, I think, quite late. Uh, in retrospect, uh, would have been better to do it earlier. Now the younger residents, I encouraged to, uh, after the first three to six months, if they're really interested to join the lab and join the meetings and the social activities and uh, the journal clubs and uh, just be present and participate and then help the older ones with their projects. And uh, typically after around six months, maybe they, they um, are ready to, and they want to do their own project and get more practical. And I think you, you can basically restart early so um you just have to do it slowly and you in my opinion you have to unfortunately you have to learn from the beginning how to handle both at the same time being uh, for example a new surgeon it's rare to get a long period of time off to just focus on the research uh, which is something you could aim to do as well there are possibilities but a lot of younger residents want to do both at the same time and uh it's doable but you have to slowly m learn how to master it and not to you know, overdo it maybe. So that's just my opinion. Uh, okay, I, I mean, I, I would argue to do it as soon as possible. If you're able to do it to, in medical school to, to get started, I think that's of course uh, <laughs> to recommend. I, I started myself, I started my residency and my supervisor said, you're gonna do an experimental um, neurotrauma PhD. You had no experience whatsoever. So I tried to do it in parallel. It was doable, but I didn't sleep much for many years. And then I actually had six months of residency to actually establish the models wouldn't have been good otherwise. And still, you can do it. You're young and motivated, you can do it. But um, in the long run, <laughs> you get tired. And I don't, the research will not benefit for you doing that all the time. So it takes some time off. Uh, I did it myself to, as a postdoc in the US uh, doing experimental TBI. So. And that, then no surgery. It was actually two good years, even though I missed surgery. So. Thank you for answering. We are saying goodbye to Professor Rostami, who's on clinical duties and has another important meeting to attend. So. Thanks, Professor, yes, I'm so for sorry. being with I, us. I can, I can just add that um, um, 
I, I agree. And I think the timing is um, really depends on you. And as Nikla said, I also started very early. I actually started in my medical school. So it really depends on your goal. And um, so if you don't know, just try it for a short period and see if it's something for you or not. But uh, it really gives you um, a lot of insight and um, uh, something, um, a perspective that uh, only doing clinical work will not. Um, so, but it's a fantastic journey. I would recommend everyone to try the preclinical studies and experimental models. It's really nice. I'm very sorry that I have to, I have to log out now, but it, uh, thank you very much for having me here. Thanks for being here. Bye. So there is another question for all of you, uh, which is, can we visit your labs? Can I take that, uh, Laura? Yeah, um, <laughs> sure. Yeah, I want to say, so adding to the previous, I think if you're interested in research, probably good, many universities offer research programs for medical students now to get a feel of it and to know is that something for you or not? And to get some, to get acquainted with methodology. Um, now answering this question, um, yes, people can, uh, well, at, at least I'm speaking for myself now, can address me um, by email. Um, it, it's probably easy to find people's emails in the papers. Um, and, and that's certainly true. Now, what we would like to do um, with the uh, uh, trauma and critical um, critical care section in the nearer future is um, to to um, to make kind of a research hub where where it is easy and 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 transparent for people to find who is doing what, and that not only will help the researchers themselves but will help young trainees or maybe even medical students to dresses uh, for observerships or, or whatever uh, opportunity um, they, they would like uh, to have. Um, so this is an idea we have and we would very much like to perceive. Well, this is amazing. I think everybody will be elated to, to know that there is, a, there is a place where to go to understand who's doing what and where to find answers from those who are already working on things. Um, another of the questions um, regards models in uh, TBI um, translated to, uh, to, to humans. So, um, but is Professor Osami already answered that? Uh, so regarding uh, blast injury and the translation of uh, research on that might be applied for military in your, for military um, environment. Um, something else came up. Uh, in terms of therapeutic targets, where is the TBI research heading towards? So I will leave that to you for answering. Uh, I don't know, I, I can probably start. Um... Yes, but always we, we you know, I think all of us who started did a lot of work on neuroprotection. You should get out living with the drug and that will help benefit TBI patients. It's not that, but it seemed to be very difficult. I would think that targets uh, um, drugs that target the more chronic uh, problems and the more evolving problems. And I think like anti-inflammatory drugs seem to be very um, promising in many aspects. So, and there are also drugs that target the mitochondrial function and the energy metabolism, et cetera. And then of course, refiner critical care for the severely injured uh, as well. But I would argue for the more long-term chronic problems that arise after TBI, that can be good targets. Um, another thing uh, in my opinion is that uh, all the, the treatments that uh, are typically assessed that aim to, you know, the target one specific pathway goal, uh, they tend to um, underestimate the complexity and heterogeneity of TBI in the clinical setting. So uh, I guess what a lot of labs are doing to synergistically add and combine treatment approaches is probably a good way to go. Also, uh, you know, treatments like stem cells that have just shown to be highly complex and difficult to translate, uh, where a lot of effort uh, has been put into, uh, th th there are benefits of the stem cell transplantation that can be 
uh, you know, used in a cell-free kind of setting as well. And there are ways now to reprogram cells in the human body without, you know, the need to transplant cells. And uh, in my opinion, if you have, um, if we have spent a lot of time on one potential treatment target, like uh, cell therapy, and we realize that it's uh, potentially not as fruitful as expected, we should also be able to leave it to take the beneficial aspects and to move uh, to the next uh, yeah, to the next treatment area and to combine what we have learned with uh, other treatment um, uh, treatments that we have tested and where we have uh, gathered some useful information and to combine this and to come up with you know a battery of a different neuroprotective, neuroregenerative, functional and also easily translatable uh, treatment combinations somehow because I feel that translation is really with those... Um, I would say simple uh, treatment approaches is really difficult. Also, I think the question was, oh, should we just skip the thicker encephalic models? I guess not, because uh, what the Brain Trauma Foundation, uh, Operation Brain Trauma in the United States, and probably the Eno will maybe do as well is to to systematically and standard uh, with a standardized uh, setting, go from uh, standardized role models to a larger animal models, and then a standard, standardized version to clinical translation which is probably way more fruitful than just, you know, rodents, go to the clinic, we do it differently, you do it differently, it's a mess, so. Huh. Just to finish off, if I may, um, so I, I think there are, there are multiple targets still to, to target. Um, and as uh, Niklas and, and Alexander explained uh, in, in therapeutics and drug development and, and, and how to um, investigate the, to improve the translational aspect as Alexander just said, but, um, there's more to that, and um, so the, most of the improvement in in outcome and survival has come from improved intensive care, and monitoring and understanding and recognizing insults and reacting to that. Uh, and even there, there's a huge number of things to even to to start be, well better understanding. If we better we so we have the monitoring tools, they yield data, and we know the numbers and the ICP, et cetera, but how to integrate that in pathophysiological events, there's still so many things that we are lacking there. So what, what we, we wanted to quickly validate PRX and start working on that in our lab. And we found that the lesson curve is, uh, is rubbish. Um, so uh, it's, it's, the, well, it's not rubbish, but it's too simplistic. Um, you know, so in all aspects, there are still many, many things to target. And therefore, we need neurosurgeons interested in research. And thanks, Laura, for uh, for organizing this because this it's an important point, I think. Yeah, I am. I'm glad that we managed to to pull it this through with the help of the ENF office because the it, I, I think that the participants being quite a lot like it's the sign that I'm not the only one interested and wanted to know more about how to start and what to target and how to formulate a research project. It's, uh, I am I'm thankful for you being here, um, taking time from your duties. And there is another question just about um, a brain tissue from surgeries. Do you, I mean, do you use uh, human brain tissue from during neurotrauma surgeries? small tiny samples uh, in research no um, well uh, I, I have done it there was the, the brain tissue bank but that was you know contus contusion extremis basically where we had to remove okay. big contusion not the routine a small sample we, we actually I should mention that we were the first to take at the exact location of an EVD in, in trauma, we took small biopsies in the, the spot where we put the, the uh, EVT in and did the, the proteomics on that. You have to see that from a normal tissue here, right frontal lobe was totally different in the uh, diffuse only injury patient than it was in more focal TBI patient. Okay. You can state that the molecular response to TBI is totally different between the different subtypes. So it's doable, but it's a lot of ethical issues and extreme safety concerns and, um, and all this uh, aspect, of course, but it is doable. And in a sense, it is relevant to, you need to come to do the road and models comparisons also in human to the extent possible, uh, but it's not easy. It's not easy. So um, to all those who are still here, you see that uh, translational is possible, even if 
they tell you we're surgeon and we shouldn't bother and just focus on DOR and that's it. For some, it might work. For others, maybe not. It's not just uh, DOR. We have to look beyond that. There is a, is a vast universe of things you can research about neurotrauma, neurosurgery, of course, but neurotrauma in this case. So I'm glad we were able here to talk about it for a, for a while and watch our space because I hope to be able to um, to post on social medias and maybe even on the website from on the social media of the, the section, uh, a map with all the uh, labs of the section so that we, you can reach out to the labs and you can bother them directly so that you can visit. And thank you everybody for being here. I don't know, there are no more questions, but I'm, I'm happy that there are a lot of, um, a lot of uh, participants from everywhere in the world. I'm seeing nice representation. Uh, there is a question actually. <laughs> There is, uh, are there opportunities to work with tissue from autopsies, like to collect tissue prospectively? So I think Professor Markland was talking about this as well, maybe with the brain bank. Uh, so yeah, well, uh, autopsies, um, it depends. Um, it's, there's also, you know, there's pros and cons to everything, but in patients who die immediately, you don't get the development of pathology. Those who die a little bit later, if that's possible to, to um, do the analysis, yes, that would be, that's extremely helpful. Um, there are some studies, Doug Smith in the US, for instance, has done important findings there on tau and beta amyloids. And um, yes, it's absolutely, that's possible. But then some have very long survival time points, and then maybe they are old and they get other issues just by aging. And, but yes, you, you should complement um, autopsies with fresh tissue if possible and the, the now refined MRI and um, the tau PET and everything else that you can do with imaging. So this combined um, can, can be a perfect complement to the rodent studies and comparing them translationally. Thank you, Professor. So I think we can wrap it up. Uh, Thanks everybody really. It was a pleasure being here and having you explaining to us. Hope to see you soon again. Thanks, Laura. Thanks. Bye to the next. Thank you, Laura. Bye-bye. Have a nice evening. Bye. Bye.